everyone uh, to our talk over here at Emerging OS Forum within the Open Source Summit Latin America. I'm Shivai with my friend Rishit, and we are going to be presenting on the topic WebAssembly based AI as a service. A very quick introduction about ourselves. I'm Shivai, I'm a developer advocate at MilliSearch and also a contributor to Layer 5 uh, and projects like Meshri, which is under the CNCF. Over to you, Rishit. Uh, hello, I'm Hello, I'm Rishit Dagli. Uh, I'm a high school student and an incoming student at the University of Toronto. You'll often find me working on machine learning and I've contributed to multiple projects, uh, open source projects and created my own, including but not limited to TensorFlow, Kubeflow, Kubernetes and more. All right. So uh, we can probably move uh, to our I main part of the slides. And that is, of course, uh, comparing the difference between Python and Rust when it comes to machine learning. Now, of course, in the traditional sense, uh, Python has always been the number one language when it comes to doing any kind of machine learning inference or actually writing machine learning models. But there are a few reasons where Rust actually might be a better uh, language to select for doing certain machine learning tasks. One of the biggest reasons why Rust is actually overtaking Python is in terms of uh, performance. Because of the fact that Rust can actually be directly compiled into machine code, uh, there is usually no virtual machine or interpreter that is required uh, in between the code and the computer, which usually is the case when we are uh, interacting with Python. And also another key advantage of Rust over Python is in terms of both thread and memory management. Uh, so while Rust does not have a proper garbage collector like we have in Python, the compiler in Rust actually enforces certain uh, invalid memory uh, reference leaks checks. And that is where uh, it really shines as compared to uh, Python. So one of the studies uh, done by uh, the picture that we showcase over here, we can actually see that uh, by the study in my, uh, by IBM, we can actually see that how Rust, when paired with WebAssembly, actually performs up to 12 to 15 times more than uh, Node.js and also uh, approximately 25 times more performance as compared to Python. So that's where uh, there are certain use cases where it might be actually beneficial to use Rust uh, instead of Python. Now, how does WebAssembly actually come into the picture? So WebAssembly is essentially a compiled target that provides executables that can actually run at uh, native speeds in very small containers. And uh, since these are uh, portable as well, that means you can actually run them anywhere without having to actually worry about uh, having to deal with uh, like, you know, separate compilation targets. Uh, it is, it can be run anywhere very easily. And uh, also at the same time, since it has its own. So let's see how does actually WebAssembly come into the picture. So well, what first of all, what exactly is WebAssembly? Well, WebAssembly is a compilation target that allows uh, and provides executables that can actually run at native speed in really small, efficient containers, but also being portable at the same time. So we don't have to actually worry about having to install and then uh, run uh, local dependencies for that particular uh, portable, ta uh, uh, portable target. It, it, since it is portable, it can run virtually anywhere. And also uh, it is highly secure at the same time. And uh, it's really great that uh, a lot of multiple languages such as uh, C++, Rust, and even scripting languages like Python, JavaScript can actually directly be uh, compiled into uh, WebAssembly uh, as the compilation target. And since uh, the code can actually run anywhere, it's also easily applicable for being able to actually uh, do uh, things such as machine learning inference and being able to actually deploy machine learning on various uh, platforms with the help of uh, WebAssembly. And now moving on to why uh, today WebAssembly is actually expanding to spaces within uh, the cloud native. So essentially WebAssembly is expanding in its the arena of machine learning, web and also cloud native being directly leveraged by some of the popular CNCF projects like Wasmedge and uh, Wasm Cloud. Uh, for those who might not be aware of what exactly is Wasmedge, it's a lightweight uh, high performance uh, WebAssembly runtime that has been specially designed for uh, edge and cloud native applications. And essentially with the help of Wasmedge, uh, we can either do things such as uh, Wasmedge being able to provide serverless functions that can be embedded into multiple software platforms uh, for like let's say being able to actually run applications on uh, the edge. 
and uh, there's also a great comparison that uh, has been provided by uh, the University of Tilburg, where uh, they compare uh, the execution of uh, machine learning with the help of uh, WebAssembly and also Docker. And it is clearly seen that uh, WebAssembly, when uh, used uh, in implementation for uh, the creation of model and, then evalu uh, and the evaluation, uh, both the container size and also the time of execution that it actually took for the machine learning inference was actually smaller with uh, comparison to uh, the Docker implementation. So you can see that when it comes to smaller applications or uh, edge-based applications, um, uh, being able to actually leverage uh, WebAssembly and especially on edge devices or edge applications, it's much more smaller in, in terms of being more lightweight and also in terms of uh, the overall uh, inference time that it actually takes. Then, of course, uh, we can also use a uh, machine, uh, we can also use Wasm Edge and specifically WebAssembly for uh, edge applications and specifically uh, for edge functions. Now, uh, one of the reasons why uh, you should actually use uh, WebAssembly and, like, you know, specifically Wasm Edge in terms of uh, serverless computing is because of the fact that in comparison to your standard high uh, performance functions that might be uh, written in C uh, or Rust they can actually be directly compiled into WebAssembly. And the WebAssembly functions are much more faster as compared to uh, some of the more popular languages that might be uh, used to actually create serverless functions such as JavaScript or Python. And uh, there are a few other benefits of actually using uh, WebAssembly as well, for, specifically for serverless functions. So one of the biggest ones being that, uh, as we have mentioned previously, that the bytecode that is usually provided by WebAssembly is uh, really portable. So uh, the developers don't actually have to worry uh, or have to uh, make modifications to the underlying ser uh, serverless functions that they, act uh, they have to run on multiple uh, platforms such as multiple OS or multiple uh, like, you know, devices or, like edge devices. So uh, they don't have to worry about that as compared to like, let's say other serverless functions written in JavaScript, Python that might be more uh, dependent on the OS and the hardware on which they're actually running. Uh, so essentially the same uh, WebAssembly functions can be reused by developers in various cloud environments. And also uh, they are much more uh, secure. So uh, essentially we can extend the WebAssembly uh, sandbox security uh, to these edge uh, functions as well, to these serverless functions. And uh, that essentially helps us to run uh, like, you know, these uh, serverless functions in a very safe in environment. That means you can actually do things like machine learning, AI inference at full native speed, uh, having the security that is provided by the sandbox uh, of the WebAssembly. So these are some of the benefits that actually come when we are actually using uh, WebAssembly as compared to your standard serverless functions being written in uh, JavaScript or Python. In this slide, we have basically done the benchmarking of uh, different uh, environments for a very popular machine learning model that is the MobileNet V2 model. So over here, basically we are comparing the performance in terms of how much time does it actually take for inference. So you can see the different type of environments that we have actually used. We have used the Wasm Edge. We've also used uh, TF Flight that is very popular for uh, machine learning for uh, mobile devices. And then we have also used uh, the standard TensorFlow Python and also uh, TensorFlow.js, which is uh, essentially being able to run machine learning models on the web. And as you can see that uh, the least amount of time that it took was on Wasm Edge with the ahead of time compilation. Uh, as so you can clearly see that when it comes to, uh, specifically for edge devices, uh, the inference time that it took for, uh, uh the bosom edge was the least. And that means it's one of the most highly performant ones, uh, especially for edge use cases. So that is why, uh, bosom edge is really, really, uh, popular and very much more, uh, in like, you know, I'm sorry, uh, we'll cut this out. We'll, uh, yeah. So, uh, as you can see that bosom edge is. Uh, really uh, secure and also it is uh, very much optimized for edge uh, based applications. And for our demonstration that we have for today, uh, this is our tech stack. So we'll be using Rust, WebAssembly, Wasm Edge, and Vercel for uh, the serverless functions and also Kubernetes. So now we come to the interesting part of demos and we'll see a couple of demos uh, using WebAssembly uh, and, uh, and we'll also see how you can deploy it as a function as a service. And finally, we'll also see how you can use Kubernetes to manage it. Uh, the code for all of these demos is already open source. Uh, you can find it on GitHub at this link. 
Um, so on to the interesting part demos. So the first demo we'll be seeing is running uh, running the WebAssembly app locally using Wasm Edge, and we'll see JavaScript and Rust demos. Uh, so for JavaScript, we'll actually be using the Wasm Edge minus QGIS interpreter, uh, which is a runtime, so you can run uh, JavaScript in WebAssembly. And uh, uh, well, uh, obvious question you might have would be: Is it slower than V8? Uh, and well, the QGIS interpreter is slower than V8. But uh, given the specific conditions of uh, when you would actually use it, especially in cases of high performance computing, uh, then a quick JS could, uh, could be very, uh, the, then the Wasm H minus quick JS runtime could be very much helpful. Machine learning is a prime example of that, and which is what we'll be seeing. I also have all of this in a GitHub repository uh, to make it easy for you to follow along. So the first thing we'll be doing is adding the Wasm32 minus Wasi target. And uh, Wasi is essentially a standardization of system calls. So you could use Wasm outside the web as well. Uh, so it provides consistent system calls. So you can use Was uh, Wasm outside the web as well. So we'll just add this target and then we'll try to build QuickJS, uh, Wasm edge minus QuickJS. And notice that we also put in minus minus features equal to TensorFlow. So that allows us to add TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite extensions um, uh, very easily, uh, which is what we want to do. So I've already built this, which is why it didn't took a lot, took us a lot of time. But what I want to show you is uh, let's just quickly go to uh, uh, let's just quickly go to uh, let's just cd into target of uh, wasm32 minus wasi slash release, and let's do an ls over here. So what you can see is uh, we have a wasm edge underscore quick js dot wasm. So this is a dot wasm file, the wasm edge quick js interpreter, which we'll be using to run any JavaScript with, uh, with WebAssembly. Uh, okay, so now, uh, let's clear this out. So now what we want to do is uh, actually take a look at a JavaScript example and run it locally. So I have a couple of them over here. You can essentially try out any one, but I'll, for now, let's just try out the mobile net v2 demo. And, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong directory, okay. Ah, uh, uh, went a couple directories to back, I guess. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, now let's go to the uh, mobile net v2 slash ports directory. So this is a very simple mobile net model uh, that uh, that classifies different bird species. And if you see, we have the wasm edge underscore with js dot wasm or uh, wasm interpreter. So the JavaScript code we have here is pretty straightforward as well. We are using the TensorFlow Lite APIs to load the image we have. Uh, we are doing any kind of Pre-processing we need uh, to do on that in your uh, audio is just resizing it to 192 plus 192. Uh, I'm then loading my TensorFlow Lite model and then simply running the in inference uh, based on the TensorFlow Lite model. Uh, but you can of course have different pre-processing or post-processing steps as you would need. And we also have um, uh, and we also have the wasm edge underscore quick js dot wasm interpreter the dot wasm file. So, uh, so let's actually try running a JS example locally. And um, uh, what I'll do for that is, uh, um, so I'll just, uh, ra uh, ra oh, I have a command here as well. So uh, if, uh, you, uh, you can feel free to um, um, also use these commands uh, uh, for your own, uh, while trying these demos out for, your, uh, for yourself. And, um, so what what this command essentially does is runs the uh, runs a dot uh, runs the wasm application locally using the wasm edge minus tensorflow minus light utility. It mounts the current directory and uh, then passes it the dot wasm file the quick uh, wasm edge underscore quick js interpreter and the main dot js file which is actually the JavaScript code you want to run with WebAssembly. Uh, so that was about the uh, JavaScript example. And running it, uh, and running it with locally or uh, with wasm edge. Let's now take a look at the Rust example. 
So, uh, so the idea we have is trying to run the same model in Rust, the one we ran in JavaScript. And this is actually like the code uh, based on which the benchmarks were also made, the benchmarks you saw earlier. So uh, yeah, this is actually the same model. So let's just go to the Rush mobile net v2 directory. Uh, so Rush mobile net v2. So now that I'm in the directory, what I'll first do is I'll uh, build this application. And this shouldn't take a lot of time because I've already built it earlier. Yes. So uh, now I've built my application and uh, something you'll see again is uh, if I go to target version 32 minus Rosy slash release and let's do an LS over here. So I have the classify.wasm file and this is on the classify.wasm file is what we'll be running uh, uh, running when we uh, want to add on this last app with WebAssembly. So uh, let's try running the classify.wasm file locally uh, with wasm edge. So uh, another thing you can also do is like AOT compile down. So we also, uh, so a lot of speed of WebAssembly actually comes from, from, comes from ahead of time compiling it. So essentially converting the .wasm file to the .so, the Linux shared library format file. And uh, uh, that is machine specific. Uh, so it is dependent on the uh, machine, essentially machine native code. So you can also do that with wasm hc minus tensorflow, but we'll uh, see that in another demo. Uh, right now, uh, what we can do is uh, simply use the wasm edge minus tensorflow minus light utility to run the rust app locally. Uh, oh, uh, it seems I don't have. Oh, uh, okay, I see. So I put in the wrong image. Uh, this was for another demo. You can also like feel free to try out the other Rust demos I have in this directory. Uh, but the image we actually have here is because this is the same model, uh, the board image. So let's put in that image and run. Okay, so I've made a path error over here. I don't have a classified.wasm file over here because it's in the target version 32 minus wasi uh, slash release directory. Now this should go with, oh yes. So it actually uh, uh, takes 215 milliseconds to run this mobile net v2 model and it actually correctly predicts it as well, just like our JavaScript uh, uh, just like the JavaScript uh, uh, demo we showed, this was able to correctly predict it as well. So that's good. But a lot of speed of WebAssembly can also come from ahead of time compiling it down. So you could get some really great speed up on this uh, on this benchmark as well. And we and I'll show you uh, how you can ahead of time compile it as well. So let's now take a look at uh, how you would uh, how you deploy this as a function as a service. So uh, well, uh, that is pretty simple too. And uh, the first thing uh, that we'll do is uh, I'll, I'll let us go to the function as a service directory, and I'll also show you uh, how similar it is. So I have a I have a function over here uh, called the image classification function. So if you see on the left uh, my directory structure, so I have the image classification function, and um, I'll just open up the Rust code. And uh, this is essentially the same Rust code we used earlier. Uh, so this makes use of the wasm edge tensorflow interface, loads my uh, loads my mobile net uh, model, uh, and uh, does any does any kind of pre-processing that's required. In this case, we just have a resize. Uh, let me go. Okay, uh, we just have a resize to resize it to two twenty four by two twenty four pixels. Of course, pre-processing or post-processing steps could differ. And then I actually get the output from a particular node. Uh, so this is actually really similar to the Rust example we saw earlier running locally. Uh, so first, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll build this application. Uh, so I have some commands over here. 
uh, to do it quickly for me. So let's just run this. So what this does is uh, build the Wasm application by a uh, function that you just saw. And uh, now what this does is, uh, remember uh, the dot .wasm file that is created. So this will also, because we just built it uh, using the wasm32 minus wasi target, this will also create a dot .wasm file. And what we want is uh, or to have the dot .wasm file in the root directory uh, from where we are deploying that function. So that is just what we are doing. Uh, simply getting the dot .wasm file, which is in wasm32 minus wasi slash release. Uh, uh, to the root directory. So now uh, let us try deploying our function. Uh, but before I do that, I also have the, uh, I also, okay, so this is my function and I have my classify.wasm file over here, which is what we just compiled. And I also have uh, this pre.sh file. So what this pre.sh file is actually doing is it's using the wasm hc minus tensorflow. So remember what wasm hc minus tensorflow was used to do. It was used to convert your dot wasm files to uh, and ahead of time compile down your dot wasm files. So this actually takes all the dot wasm files. In our case, we just have one dot wasm file, classify dot wasm. So this takes the classify dot wasm file and it converts it to a dot so file, uh, the Linux shared library format. So uh, the ahead of time compile down file is also machine native code. Um, and uh, because it is machine native code and can only run on a particular device, uh, set of uh, our devices, uh, that is uh, that also gives rise to something called the WebAssembly universal format, which is the .wasm file plus the uh, uh, plus the ahead of time compiled uh, .sf file. So we'll also ahead of time compile down our code uh, this time. So, uh, so, so let's uh, uh, run this and uh, what we'll do is we'll simply use virtual deploy. So, uh, virtual deploy will allow us to simply deploy this to virtual functions. Uh, of course, you should have the virtual CLI uh, already installed. Uh, let's open this link. So, this is my... Uh, uh, so this is my uh, virtual dashboard where I can see uh, that it's already building. So it might take a moment or so to build because we just supply the function as a service application right now. It still has to ahead of time compile down the wasm. Uh, and let's see. Oh, so uh, if you see uh, now it actually started compiling down the ahead of uh, it ahead of time compiled down our dot wasm files. I've uh, got them in .so files and uh, the build is actually done uh, and uh, we should now be able to uh, check out uh, check out the uh, uh, deployed function as a service. So uh, let's select a photo and I'll actually select a, a pretty popular photo. Uh, and uh, le let's uh, click on classify with Wasm. So this is so let's select a photo and I'll actually select a pretty popular photo. Uh, let's click on classify with wasm and this is actually a pretty popular photo and uh, uh, okay. and this is actually calling the rust function which we wrote. Uh, the machine learning model, the mobile, the uh, the mobile net model we wrote uh, using Rust. Uh, it is calling this mobile net model, and uh, this is not actually the same birds model which we were using earlier to classify different between different bird species. Uh, this is a generic model at the end of the image net data set, so it is able to classify other uh, other things apart part of birds as well, and. Um, uh, so when we clicked on classify with wasm, it actually called uh, it actually called our uh, Rust code, uh, which we had used to do the machine learning inference, and it also correctly classifies this as a comic book. Uh, so uh, that was about our second demo, uh, deploying it as a function as a service. So the next demo we'll be seeing is running. Uh, running uh, web assemblies uh, and managing them with Kubernetes side by side by Linux containers.
So let's take a look at uh, uh, the Rust Mobile Net V2 demo, which we had seen earlier. And uh, what I'll do is because I already have the dot wasm file, so I'll just uh, come down to the dot wasm file I have over here, uh, which is in. Uh, so uh, let's just go to target. Uh, wasm 32 minus wasi slash lease. So over here I have a classify dot wasm file. So let's just create a Docker file over here and uh, let's open the Docker file. So uh, this one is already pre-populated from you uh, for you. But uh, what this essentially does is uh, uh, simply runs the dot, uh, uh, simply runs the dot wasm file. So that is all our Docker image contains. Uh, uh, so that is all the Docker file contains. And uh, now that we want to build the image, uh, we also need to specify that uh, we don't want the image to have a guest OS uh, because we are running it on uh, running it with WebAssembly. So what you can do is use something like uh, build up and uh, uh, and uh, simply add the annotation uh, to tell that uh, this uh, this is uh, a WebAssembly image, and we don't need a guest OS for this. So uh, so let's just uh, uh, I'll do a build. Oh, yes. So uh, let's just use builder to build a Docker image. Uh, and um, I have actually built an image now. Uh, and now you could easily do something like sudo builder push and push it to anywhere you want. GCR or uh, literally any other container registry. You could very easily do that. Uh, so uh, so let's take an example. Uh, let's take a look at an example uh, for, for an image that is already out there. So uh, there is a pretty popular image uh, 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 maintained by the Wasm Edge team, uh, and this image is essentially made to try out uh, uh, try out Wasi and just uh, it's a very simple REST application that just tries out uh, made to just try out uh, Wasi and uh, make some prints out some random numbers, opens a file, creates a file. So uh, a very simple uh, was the example. And an image for this already exists. So I already have a kind Kubernetes cluster created. And what I'll try to and what I'll try to do is uh, just uh, is just uh, run this uh, WebAssembly, uh, this WebAssembly image. So uh, so what we already have over here uh, is uh, this is the wasm wasi example, and uh, this essentially runs the uh, runs a WebAssembly image in the kind Kubernetes cluster, which I already have created. Um, so this is the sample application I was talking about, and uh, uh, this is running it inside a kind Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I'll go see. So. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, this was uh, the final demo about how you can uh, easily create images from your web assemblies and uh, then run those images uh, and run those images uh, inside a Kubernetes cluster and manage it with Kubernetes. Now, uh, specifically talking about uh, why to actually use Kubernetes with Wasmich. So essentially, Kubernetes uh, managed microservices and uh, edge services have actually gained quite a lot of uh, popularity. But there is actually a growing demand for a uh, lot lighter weight containers that are actually appropriate for uh, workloads such as the ones on edge devices. Because usually we know that edge devices are usually constrained in terms of the resources. So if we uh, use some traditional uh, Linux containers, uh, they are not the most optimized specifically for its uh, edge applications because of the fact that uh, generally the Linux containers uh, are really large in size. And also the fact that uh, the compute time to actually uh, set up and run these uh, Linux containers is really large. Now, if we uh, take into comparison WebAssembly based uh, containers, uh, WebAssembly containers are having a smaller footprint in terms of the size and also the amount of time that actually takes to boot up and start using uh, uh, like, you know, like a, basically a WebAssembly container. So in terms of the size, uh, usually the WebAssembly applications are just 1% of the size of a standard Linux application container. And then also in terms of performance, uh, they can uh, 
be uh, anywhere from 10 to 100 times uh, more performant as compared to uh, your standard Docker based containers, uh, Linux containers. So that is why WebAssembly is a really good choice for uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, but yes, with that, uh, that kind of brings us to the end of our entire uh, presentation. So you can uh, reach out to us on our uh, Twitter handles, uh, how to and underscore Dagli, in case you want to uh, get in touch with us, or if you want to have uh, any questions regarding our presentation today, but now we'll be open to questions. Uh, uh, we did collect some of the questions, uh, asked regarding our talk from the audience, and we'll be taking up a few of them in this presentation today. So one of the most commonly asked questions that we uh, got uh, within the audience was, uh, is WebAssembly used outside the web? So of course, uh, if you look at the terminology as WebAssembly, a lot of times it's confusing to uh, those who hear the terminology for the first time uh, since it's associated with web. But actually the term WebAssembly itself is not really related to uh, web at all. Uh, specifically, we break it down into the web and assembly. Uh, the assembly part comes uh, from the factor that how, uh, like, you know, web assembly is actually created. So as you know, it's a binary, inst binary instruction format. And uh, originally, although the focus of web assembly was mainly for web, to be able to actually uh, use certain other languages such as C++, Rust, and then actually compile them into this uh, bytecode and then run uh, more highly computational tasks within the browser. But since then, the ecosystem for WebAssembly has expanded a lot more, uh, even on the server side and on edge. And you actually see more number of applications for WebAssembly today uh, outside of the web rather than just being on the web. So whether it is uh, being able to actually make, like let's say your traditional uh, backend frameworks like Node.js more performant, or uh, you being utilized for being able to actually run your uh, standard uh, services instead of using Docker, uh, they can actually be run on WebAssembly. So WebAssembly today is being utilized as container. And uh, of course, uh, we are seeing a lot of different applications like being able to run highly conventional tasks uh, on the edge as well by utilizing WebAssembly because of the smaller footprint and the security that WebAssembly provides. And in this talk uh, that we have showcased, we have showcased exa example of WebAssembly being actually utilized uh, for serverless uh, programming as well, uh, specifically by taking an example of uh, machine learning on the uh, as function as a service with the help of uh, WebAssembly. So the general in uh, the entire general ecosystem for uh, WebAssembly is, is expanding quite a lot uh, in a lot of different use cases outside of the browser. So uh, we have a number of different services. For example, we have a number of front times you can take a look at, including Wasm uh, Edge, Wasm. Uh, uh, cloud. Uh, and then we also actually are able to spin up microservices with the help of uh, some of these services such as Spin and Fermion. So you can also take a look at those as well. So um, from uh, being able to actually run simple AI based services to actually being able to spin up uh, entire microservices, uh, you'll, you'll see the uh, use of WebAssembly in all of these different use cases, especially on the server side and, and in the cloud native side. So the next question we have is, uh, could you shed some more light on, uh, on WASI and uh, how it is used? Okay. So WebAssembly system interfaces, uh, at the forefront, uh, bringing WASI to, uh, platforms other than the web. And, uh, it plays an important role, uh, when you try to do so, uh, a, a particularly, uh, interesting analog I could give, uh, is, um, uh, let's say, uh, you think of it as, uh, so some programming languages give you access to, let's say, some system calls. Uh, a system call could be something like uh, opening a file, uh, deleting a file, creating a file, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, and, uh, and a lot more, just a couple of examples of system calls. Uh, and, uh, well, if you think a programming language directly gives you access to all of these system calls, uh, well, they don't. Uh, so let's say if you're writing some C or C++ code to open a file, uh, what you would essentially have to do is uh, I use the C or C++ syntax to open a file and under the hood, what that does is translates it into a system call as the, as the kernel, uh, if it can uh, do, if it can uh, perform the system call and uh, uh, why does a kernel come in between? Uh, and well, that's because uh, all of these tasks are uh, way too important. Uh, you need to ensure that the right user with the right privileges is being able to do these tasks and is not uh, impacting the performance of any other processes that might be running. 
So all of these system calls are uh, pretty important, which is why in a traditional setting, you have a Linux kernel in between. Uh, and a uh, WebAssembly system interface essentially standardizes these system calls. So, uh, so uh, let's say if you're writing some C, C++ or Rust code uh, to, be, uh, to be then compiled to a WebAssembly, uh, you, would, uh, you would want to use a WASI system calls uh, and a WebAssembly doesn't uh, will just um, stop at porting your source code. So you can most certainly port your source code uh, but WebAssembly doesn't stop at that uh, because uh, well even after porting the source code you still have to uh, you still have to compile your source code into a machine specific format so the WebAssembly system interface goes beyond that uh, you can uh, you can use any language you want compile it once and then run it in any wasm uh, wasm recognized runtime so uh, uh, that, that is what the WebAssembly system interface allows you to do. And this OS level emulation is actually highly uh, beneficial, uh, uh, more than traditional sandboxing. So, uh, uh, so WebAssembly system interfaces are very much useful, especially in uh, bringing WebAssembly uh, outside the web and standardizes all of the system calls. All right, uh, so the next question is, what are the alternative uses for AI-based uh, functions as a service and why the WebAssembly approach might be better? So, uh, originally we have seen that uh, the rise of a lot of different serverless functions, and that's why uh, we're also seeing functions as a service being uh, really popular. Now, traditionally, in most use cases, if you are utilizing any of the major uh, cloud uh, platforms, such as uh, AWS, GCP, or Azure, uh, we are aware of uh, things like AWS Lambda, which allows for uh, creation of uh, very easy serverless functions. And uh, these serverless functions can actually be uh, utilized for anything. And uh, there are some uh, really great uh, examples for actually being able to utilize uh, AI-based services with the help of these, uh, like, you know, things such as these serverless functions, such as AWS Lambda. And essentially, uh, all these different cloud uh, pl platforms do provide you being able to actually run the inference uh, directly inside of um, the cloud provider and then have these serverless functions that you can uh, utilize uh, to do all the training and inference uh, for you. Now, uh, the reason why WebAssembly is a better approach uh, because of the fundamental way in which WebAssembly actually works. So uh, the first point being uh, that WebAssembly is highly portable. Now, traditionally, if you were to, uh, like, let's say migrate over your entire uh, function as service uh, and AI based function as service from one platform to another, there will be certain platform dependencies uh, due to which you'll have to make changes to your uh, to your functions as well. Uh, but with uh, the help of WebAssembly, since WebAssembly is highly portable, uh, usually it's just a single target once, uh, like, you know, you have utilized your highly conventional uh, languages such as Rust or uh, C++ into uh, the specific uh, bytecode that we have generated. It can actually run across multiple OS and multiple uh, systems. Uh, so you don't have to uh, worry too much about having to uh, actually edit or change uh, the configuration for your uh, functional service. And uh, B, uh, the security model, the sandboxing model uh, on which WebAssembly is actually based, uh, what that means is that um, essentially your entire calls uh, run inside of the sandbox environment, and that makes uh, WebAssembly highly secure. So uh, whenever you're running any kind of an inference, AI-based inference, uh, those will be running inside of the sandbox environment, making it a lot more secure as compared to traditional uh, uh, functional service uh, being provided by other uh, providers. Uh, like, you know, if you're like, let's say, traditionally using something like a Python-based uh, service function or a JavaScript-based uh, service function. So those are uh, the two major uh, reasons why uh, the WebAssembly approach is actually better as compared to other uh, alternatives and especially uh, if you are uh, running like you know your uh, functional service for a low uh, like you know low compute uh, platforms uh, that's where it really shines as compared to some of the other options that currently exist for a uh, functional service uh, for specifically ai related tasks the next question we have is how does uh, any web assembly uh, how does any web assemblies you write integrate with the javascript interpreter uh, so this is an interesting question because uh, 
uh, you can also have uh, your web assemblies and side by side with your uh, with any JavaScript business code or business logic you might have. Uh, so, so what we can do is uh, actually use the Wasm engine. So the demo we actually showed uh, just covered how you can uh, how you can write JavaScript code and have it as uh, and run it as a, a web assembly. But we actually didn't see how you can run web assembly side by side with uh, JavaScript. So uh, and uh, this is actually pretty easy to do with the Wasm bind chain. So that allows you to have your JavaScript code, the JavaScript interpreter and your JavaScript code side by side with the web assemblies and the web assembly uh, and the web and the Wasm DMs you have. Uh, so uh, you can very easily, uh, uh, so you can very easily have both of these side by side and create uh, a JavaScript applications with embedded Rust functions. Um, and uh, and the link between uh, the link between uh, JavaScript and the WebAssembly uh, is actually done by the Wasm engine, and uh, you can also uh, take a better look at this. So those are all the questions we had. Thank you so much, uh, Anis. Uh, we hope to see you in uh, in person at the next Open Source Summit Latin America. Thank you.